title of your notes today, X Marks the Spot. I'm going to have you turn to two verses um, that'll help us unpack this, and I'll show you a quick illustration, and then we'll look at some people in the Word of God that we can learn from. Obviously, your natural disciplines matter, but we, you know, I want you to write this statement down, your natural location matters. Your natural location matters. Your natural location matters. If you'll turn with me in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm going to be reading from the Amplified Classic. That's what's going to be on the screen. But you go ahead and have that in, in your Bible. If you don't already have it highlighted, definitely want to have uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 highlighted in your Bible. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. If you already have it, help your neighbor if they don't know where it's at. If you don't know where it's at, I encourage you to learn where it's at. Definitely don't want to have stats and other things that we're proficient in if we don't know how to proficiently handle this. Amen? So if you don't turn to them here, I don't know how you turn to it outside of here. I know we go fast, but you got to go faster. Amen? You can be good at whatever you want to be good at. So this is not summer school. This is not vacation Bible school. 1 Corinthians 11.1. The Amplified Classic says, pattern yourselves. Everyone say, pattern yourselves. After me, Paul's making this statement. He said, follow my example. Now, this isn't going to be on the screen, but I want you to see the Hebrew definition of the word follow, and then I'll just give it to you as, um, as a regular definition. The word follow, I want you to write this down, um, to move behind in the same path or direction to move behind in the same path or the same direction. Now, can you follow someone online? You cannot follow somebody online. How can you follow somebody online? You're there and they're there. You can't follow somebody online. Can you follow somebody on this? No. We have to be so aware of how the enemy tries to pervert everything that's actually real. Okay? Or you'll live a perversion of what you were intended to be to the degree that you fall for that. So to move behind in the same path or direction. Another definition of follow is to go with a leader. Can you go with them online? No. You have to be with them. You can't go with them if you're not with them. Which means you can't follow them if you're not with them. When Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He didn't invite them to a service. They left everything. They left everything that they had. They left their wives. They left their businesses. They, left, they didn't go to a service. They didn't go to a conference. They left everything. Say they left everything. It also means heal like your actual heel, so that when we follow someone, we are tracing their footsteps. Again, can you do that online? You can't. You can't do it online. You can't trace their footsteps online. So it means to heal, which means you're going behind them, like the, the, the implication there, because the Hebrew words always give you like a picture, like a visual, that right on their heel, you're moving into the same exact position. Everyone say position that they're in. So Paul said, I want you to pattern yourselves after me. Follow my example. Why? Because I'm imitating and I'm following Christ. That's the model. The model is that you would have leaders that follow him that you can follow. And that's how God is going to accomplish what he has planned for your life. Now go to um, Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12. And as you do, they're going to put another statement on the screen um, that's actually part two to that first one. Your natural location matters. Why? Because nothing God has called you to do can be accomplished in isolation. Nothing God has called you to do can be accomplished in isolation. Hebrews chapter 6, and I'm actually starting in about verse 11, but I'll give you time to get that statement down. Verse 
verse 11, but we do strongly, everyone say strong. We do strongly and earnestly desire for each of you to show the same diligence, say same diligence, and sincerity all the way through in realizing and enjoying the full assurance and development of your hope until the end. Now, how is that going to be accomplished? In order that you may not grow disinterested and become spiritual sluggers, but imitators behaving as do those who through faith by their leaning of the entire personality on God in Christ and absolute trust and confidence in power, wisdom and goodness, and by practice of patient endurance and waiting are now inheriting the promises. If you don't know who you're following in the flesh, we don't know who you're following in the spirit. If we don't know who you're following in the flesh, we don't know who you're following in the spirit. Ephesians 5, 1, Jesus, or Paul said, be imitators of God as dear children. But right here, he said, the only way you're going to be able to accept, successfully do that is, you, if, is if you follow somebody in real life who is inheriting those promises. And in following them, and you pattern your life after them. See, there are things that are deposited in you by proximity, by your submission, by your positioning that you cannot get any other way, any other way. So your natural location matters and you have to discipline yourself to stay where you're supposed to be, even if you don't feel like it, even if it doesn't seem like that's the place to be. And so write this down. You see it by faith, but you receive it with faithfulness. Which means you receive by faith a supernatural calling. What God has called you to do. What God's anointed you to do. What God has planned for you to do. Whether it's in the marketplace or it's in the ministry. You you have to receive all of that by faith. Nobody can see that for you. But you can't touch it. You can't lay hold of that which is divine in isolation. You can't lay hold of that which is supernatural in isolation. So you receive it with faithfulness. You show me a faithful person that's in their spot month after month, year after year. You show me a student who's at youth service week after week, month after month, year after year. I don't care who laid hands on you. I don't care who prophesied over you. You can receive all of that stuff by faith, but you can't walk into it without faithfulness. Faithfulness is the natural fruit of a spiritual root. So the real deal will manifest in your life through faithfulness. It doesn't matter how anointed you are. It doesn't matter how called you are. Lucifer was the best of the best in all of the heavenlies. But yet because he didn't stay put and he got tired of what he was given to do, he lost everything. And he's infused that same doctrine into the lives of men who would endeavor to separate themselves, first and foremost, from God, but then secondly, from his plan. What is God's plan? God's plan is the local church. God's plan is, as he calls it, the bride of Christ. And everything about his calendar is tied to his relationship with his church. Everything. And we've said it before, and you guys know it. You don't go into eternity with your last name. You don't go into eternity with your diploma. You don't go into eternity with your credentials. But you do go into eternity with your church. 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 Because everything stems out of your church, the local church. Jesus is the head of what? A ministry? A missions organization? an evangelistic organization, an orphanage, a youth ministry. There's no such thing as a youth ministry outside of a local church. Jesus is the head of the church. And if you don't get this right, it doesn't matter what else you get right. Your natural location matters. Take a look at this video. And the number one passing combination of all time, Manny to Harrison. If you wanted to know where it was going with Peyton Manning and Marvin Harrison, you really don't have to look any further than their very first preseason game. 
Payton and Small to the left side. Harrison to the right. Falk is the lone back, showing blitz of Seattle. Peyton Manning under center on third. And it was Peyton. Here he is, a rookie quarterback, and he throws a little slant pass to, 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 to Marvin, and Marvin busts it. Drop to throw the quick pass over the middle. Caught by Harrison. I know what Peyton was thinking. It's pretty easy. You know, I throw my first pass and it's a touchdown. Once you get Marvin the ball, uh, good things are going to happen. Together since 1998, good things have been happening for Manning and Harrison ever since. He got it! What a circus catch! Okay, man. Right, right He's got Marvin wide open. He throws it to him. He's got it to 40, 30, 20, comes inside, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, 10, 5, Hard work and longevity have created a unique oneness between the two. Peyton Manning and Marvin Harrison are the same person. I mean, I played with both of them in the Pro Bowl, and they could finish each other's sentences. So how much? How much did Bob? Yeah, just a little bit. They know what the other is thinking like a husband and a wife, and they have worked together so much and so closely, they could talk with their eyes. And there aren't many quarterbacks and wide receiver combinations that are able to do that. Marvin and I, on, on numerous times, have usually just kind of a head nod. And every time we've seen to do it, uh, he knows exactly kind of what I'm looking for. Manning looks, fires to the end zone for Harrison. He's got a touchdown! It's one of those things that me and another quarterback, or Peyton and another receiver, probably couldn't do. But as though we, you know, we've practiced so much, you know, we know each other's every move. <laughs> For our number one passing combination, practice led to perfection and an all-out assault on the record book. Manning throws it upfield. Marvin's got it to 45. That is 664 catches. Manning to Harrison. They are the best all-time. They now have more yards than any other passing combination in NFL history. Peyton looks for the quick throw. Lobs it in the corner to Marvin. With every major passing combination record secured, Manning to Harrison was still incomplete without a championship. I'm glad they won a Super Bowl championship. I think it just enhances uh, what these guys have done. To see guys like Harrison and Peyton Manning win a championship, I think there were a lot of people who felt good for them because they earned it. Already tops on our list and with no end in sight, how will football's most prolific passing combination be remembered? People are going to look back on that pairing of Manning and Harrison as being uh, really unique, maybe one of the last of that type. I don't think you're going to see it ever again to see guys play that long together, to be able to get that kind of chemistry. Because free agency has changed the game so much, Manning to Harrison. That combination we will talk about for decades upon decades upon decades. They both stayed healthy. They both got years ahead of them. There's no reason why these guys, when the careers are over, that they won't go down as the best passing combination of all time. No reason whatsoever. While it's still unknown how high Manning and Harrison will raise the bar for those passing combinations that follow, one thing is for sure. They, like the rest of the players on our list, could never have done it alone. You could probably watch that again and again because there's so much out of it. Um, but they still hold, I believe, the best record. And did you notice what they said changed that from potentially happening again is free agency. What does that mean? I can go wherever. There's no loyalty to a team. Like, who's going to pay me the most? Where is it going to work out the best for me? Right? So these two work together. Jesus is going to come down front really fast. Ultimately, in life, you represent the receiver because everything Jesus has done, he's already done. And it is finished. Tell your neighbor, it is finished. But as it pertains to what you are going to be able to experience and what you are going to be able to receive, he's going to give it to you one step at a time. And so the steps represented by this ball. And if you're not in the position to receive, to hear that still small voice, it's irrelevant how he throws it because he never misses. 
but people miss it because they're not in position. So if he's told me to be here, then this is where I stay until I get any other direction. Now, here's the problem. Many people in pride will like puff themselves up with the reality. Well, like I am in position, but they're distracted in position. Now I'm going to be distracted. Please don't throw it at my head because I know that Jesus wouldn't. Okay. But if I'm distracted in position, like there's people like you go here, but you don't follow me. You do not follow me. And you're a guy. You do not follow pastor Greg. No, you don't. You might be in the seat, but you do not follow us. You have not patterned your life after us. No, you have not. So whatever this distraction represents in your life. So go ahead and throw that ball as you're like 18 and wanting to receive the next instruction. I very easily was in the position to receive that, but I miss it. And guys, here's the thing. You only have so many services from the time you're a sixth grader until the time you graduate and every single one of them matters. Every single one of them is an opportunity for you to receive something beyond just the written material because some things are taught and other things are caught. I've told some of, some of these young adults that are in here, they don't, they don't carry the same stuff because some of them have never been life interns. So they don't have the same spirit. They can never have, they can fight for it now. Uh, maybe, I, I mean, but there's some of them that they, they have something different. They carry something different because they sat aside two years of their life and they, there's, you can tell, you can tell. Now, when you're in position, you can absolutely receive. Can he get the ball back? Y'all, honestly, y'all can have fun, but just know that I'm not. Okay, and y'all are wise enough to read the room, right? Because if people would get this message, we wouldn't have the problems that we have. So if you'll get it now, then you won't have problems later and have spirits that are counterproductive to the plan and the purpose of God for your life. You can take a seat, Jesus. I might have you um, help us again. Number one, you have to get out. Again, your natural location matters, and you have to defend that. You can't do what God has called you to do just anywhere. You can't do what God's called you to do anywhere. There's a set place for you. You cannot do what God's called you to do just anywhere. In Genesis chapter 12, these will be on the screen for you, verses 1 through 4. It says, Now in Haran, the Lord said to Abraham, Go for yourself, for your own advantage. Everyone say, for your own advantage. See, he wants you to get out for a reason. This is not for my benefit, so, can I, so I can have the most followers. I don't have followers in that sense. That's not, how I, that's not how I steward my life. I'm focused on the people's rear that I'm following, not the people who are following me. Okay? So this is not for my benefit. This is for your own advantage. God said, get away from your country, from your relatives and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Who's going to show you? Is the scholarship opportunity going to show you? Are your friends going to show you? Are your family, is your family going to show No. He's going to show you. I will make you what? A great nation. Why do you think so many believers don't have enough? Why do you think so many believers don't stay married? Why do you think so many believers have children out of wedlock? Why do you think so many young people lose their virginity? Why do you think so many young people end up on the streets that grew up in churches? Because he can only make a great nation of you in position. It doesn't matter what Jesus paid for. It matters if you're in position to receive. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you with abundant increase of favors. I will make your name famous and distinguished, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. I will confer prosperity and happiness upon you. And those that curse you will be cursed um, in all ways in families and in, in you and always other families and kindred of the earth will be blessed. So Abraham departed as who directed him? As the Lord directed him. Say, as the Lord directed him. 
So write this down. You can't hang out in the same places around the same people if you want to go in the direction that God has designed for your life. And guys, you're modifying this position in the sense that if there's anything that's standing in your way, you're constantly looking at things after the spirit and not after the flesh, which means you're constantly checking the inside. How's my peace? How's my attitude? How's my clarity? How's my joy? How's my prosperity? How's my healing? Because when you're where you're supposed to be, you should be blessed. You should be blessed. When you're where you're supposed to be naturally, there's a blessing there for you. Your natural position matters. And you have to discipline yourself to stay there. To stay there when, uh, when all the lights and all the attractions say, just come over here. Just come over here. You're in the, we're all Christians. It's, we're, uh, we're going to church. It's not that big of a deal. But if he directed you right here and he gave you somebody to follow, you don't move off that, you don't move off that stance if you expect to be blessed. So you have to get out. You have to get out of mentalities. Now, this is not a license to run away from home. But you can be in an environment and not let the environment be in you. Once you hear the word, you set your face like flint. And you come to church and you see examples in front of you that model that and you stop playing the victim. Listen, if you are the product of a broken home, you're no longer in the minority. You're in the majority. So you're no longer a victim. That's the status quo. So stop feeling sorry for yourself. Maybe look at the people that have got two parents at home that don't get the same attention and the same meetings and the same conversations because they have a mom and a dad. Stop with that already. You can't be a victor and a victim at the same time. You have to decide. If you've been blessed with an example in spite of the one that you were born into, Why are you still crying? You can't experience his joy and his peace in your emotions. So you have to decide. You have to decide. God wanted Abraham out of that place so that he could get something to him. Again, that doesn't mean that you run away, but it means, and it doesn't mean that you're disrespectful. It doesn't mean that you're dishonoring. But you just kind of have a resolve within yourself that this is the direction I'm going. This is the direction, this, I know this is what the Lord said. So I'm going to pattern my life this way. Number two, you have to be led by him and not your senses. You have to be led by him and not your senses. I want to give you this statement before I read these verses because I think it will help you as we look at the life of Isaac, who is Abraham's son. Circumstances and opportunities aren't the leading of the Lord. Again, you have to be led by him and not your senses. I can't tell you the number of times over the years somebody's like, well, these people are giving me a scholarship. Guys, universities need so many butts in the seat in order to meet their financial obligations. I'm not saying you're not smart, and I'm not saying you're not a good athlete, but if you're going to let a wicked and godless opportunity direct your life, you are not going to experience the supernatural blessings of God. So a letter in your mailbox, okay, an opportunity from a coach. Well, they really want me to be on the debate team. There's no one on the debate team. (laughs) And you argue about everything, so they thought you would be good. You use all of these things as indicators. Why? Because you don't really have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You can tell when someone needs you. You can't, be, you can't move your life based on that. You can't move your life based on that. Which, was, which is why we're very, we're very wise and discreet in articulating opportunities and different things that are here because I don't need you. I can preach to my stuffed animals. That's what I did as a kid. I don't have any youth pastors that I'm connecting with every Thursday and comparing how, si- how large the youth service was. I don't even get the youth service count. 
literally, I have no idea how many teenagers come to this church on a Wednesday night. No idea. I think what I would guess would probably not even be accurate. <laughs> right? So as it pertains to your life, circumstances and opportunities aren't the leading of the Lord. Over the years, pastors Greg and I have had multiple opportunities to leave Hobbs. Multiple opportunities. I can tell when someone wants you. I already belong to somebody. And I'm not here because this is my parents' ministry. I know a lot of pastor's kids who cannot and will not serve alongside their parents. That just doesn't happen to be us. I'm not here because this is the family business. I'm here because this is where the Lord told us to be. And we've had multiple opportunities to be somewhere else. And ask, why Hobbs? There's the same kind of teenagers all across America. There's the same devils all around America. I'm going to be the same here as I would be anywhere else in America. But the reality is, if he told me to be here, then that's where the anointing is. That's where the favor is. That's where the blessing is. Irrespective of the restaurants that are elsewhere. Or the stores. Right? So circumstances and opportunities aren't the leading of the Lord. The still small voice is the leading of the Lord. Everyone say still small voice. Genesis 26, 1 through 6, 12 through 14. And there was a famine in the land and other other than the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar and Abimelech, king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, don't go down there. Don't go to Egypt. Live in the land, which I will tell you. Dwell temporarily in this land. I'll be with you and will favor you with blessings for you and your descendants. I will give you these lands and I will perform the oath, which I swore to Abraham, your father. And I will make your descendants to multiply as the stars of the heaven. Do you see that the blessing is very like geographical? His goodness covers the earth, but if you're not in position to receive, it'll go right by you. His blessing is very geographical. It's in a set place. Well, it's just me and the Lord. No, it's not. That's a doctrine of devils. It's not you and the Lord. And it's not even you and a feeling. It's you and a pastor. It's you and an under shepherd. It's you and a church. And that will move with you into eternity. Because everything that you're responsible for in eternity, if he keeps record of every child that you gave a cup of cold water to, if he keeps record of tithes and offerings, what is that associated with? Your church responsibilities. Your church relationships. Which is why the enemy wants to pervert everything about that. There's nothing wrong with being able to view opportunities and services and to be taught online but you can't be pastored online. I, I, I don't know how you can have online church. There's no accountability in that. There's no accountability in that. Somebody has to know you, right? You can't have a dentist appointment on Skype. They have to get in there and they have to do the work. Two of the biggest dates on your natural calendar the day you're wed and the day you're dead. Who's going to do that for you online? So Isaac stayed in Gerar and he sowed seed in that land and received in the same year a hundred times. Everyone say a hundred times. A hundred times as much as he had planted. And again, the Lord favored him with blessings. Now, would that have been his story in Egypt? Even though everything in Egypt was much more fertile. Everyone say much more fertile. There was a famine where he was. But he went ahead and did what he had always done. And he stayed directed by the Lord. And what happened? He received a hundredfold in that time. And the man became great, verse 13 says. And he gained more and more until he became very wealthy. Everyone say very wealthy. He owned flocks, herds, and a great supply of servants, and the Philistines envied him. Number three, what you look at moves you. Again, your natural position matters, and you have to defend that. And it's a spiritual thing. 
It's not a natural thing. It's not just about going through the motions. It's not even just about being at church here, although you do need to be where you're supposed to be. But there have been people that have been here that haven't really been here. And so before long, they're not here. And you love them. You love people. You don't want to see them go down. But you don't turn around. You have to keep going. Genesis 12 and verse 12. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and he pitched his tent toward. Everyone say toward. He pitched his tent toward Sodom. See, what you look at moves you. It moves you. So Lot is in position. Now, in many cases, we can look at the scripture and think, why did Abraham take Lot? Because he wasn't supposed to take Lot. But potentially, uh, Lot is um, orphaned. Abraham has become like a father to him, even though he's his nephew. And so he comes along for the ride. And so as Abraham is blessed, Lot is blessed. And the land can no longer contain them. You know what that means. If you've ever had to share a room with a sibling, like you get to a certain point and you're like, listen, this room cannot contain both of us any longer. Please, can you get them out? Like I need my own space, right? And so that's what happened. And Abraham said, listen, there's strife between our people. And, and I, I can't have that. Because James chapter 3, verse 16 says, where there's strife, there's confusion and every evil work. And so Abraham said, listen, uh, this isn't going to work. Now, I personally believe Lot had a decision to make. Because, you know, I, I've had this, you know, I've heard people say this over the year. You, you know, there, we've had multiple opportunities, um, you know, to be offended, but we just stayed. And I'm like, you know what? I've had multiple opportunities to be offended, too. Like with your kids. When they're disrespectful and they don't. You don't say that. What is, am I supposed to give you a gold star? Because you've had multiple opportunities to be offended with people who love God and love his word and have fruit in their life. What actually is offensive? What actually is offensive? Let's talk about it. What's actually offensive? We've had so many opportunities to be offended, but we just stuck it out. Gold star. I wish I... Man... Bring my gold stars. I don't think I have anything in here. Some lint. Oh. <laughs> no, that's not in my pocket. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, you just fix it. You just fix it. You just fixed it. The last time somebody told me I've been offended with you, and I've stirred up a lot of gossip and a lot of problems in the church, and I ask you to forgive me. They were dead in three years. I forgave them. Absolutely. But you set things in motion because I, I'm, there's something that when you are called of God, you carry. And then every time you're where you're supposed to be, God adds those things to you. So when I go to Rama, there's, well, let me start with John George. When I go there, there's an impartation. When I go to Rama, there's an impartation. When I keep seeking the Lord, when I go to Pastor Nancy's Dufresne's church and I stand at the altar and I receive prayer, she doesn't lay her hands on me. She wraps her arms around me and cries to the Lord, everything in me, put it in her. She didn't do that with everybody else. She didn't do that with anybody else. I don't tell you that so that I have good cred. I could give two rips about what people think about me. Because from that moment forward, I knew I had decisions to make. Because something was put in me that now I had to steward. That before I went up there, I didn't have. But now I have that. And I'm going to be responsible for that. I'm going to be responsible for the things that Joe Morris said over me that I don't even repeat because I don't want to really be responsible for them in all honesty. So every time you're in position, there's something that's given to you that you have to do something with. If you keep walking by sight, and there's nothing wrong with things being excellent in your sight. There's nothing wrong with having fun. There's nothing wrong with playing games. There's nothing wrong with jumping and dancing and leaping and enjoying each other's fellowship. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't go deeper for you than that, it will not sustain the gift and the call that God has for your life. Because all of that's fun. 
But that's not the main event. That's not the main event. So ultimately, Lot has some, so, so there's some stuff that's like stirring in his people. Maybe it wasn't in him. Guys, you decide what stirs in you. You don't get a gold star because you were offended and you stayed. You, did, you get a gold star when you stop making your emotions so important. And if you think people are offensive, then don't be around them. I don't want to be around somebody that I feel like I have to walk on eggshells with. That every time I preach, they're like fearful. They're going to get corrected. What do you want to get? What do you want to get? What do you want to get? What is that book supposed to do for your life? I thought it was profitable for instruction. I don't want to go to my dentist and him sit there and tell me how beautiful my eyes are. I don't want to go to my dentist and him talk to me about my nails or my clothes or my handbag and just feel excited that I showed up. I want him to get the little tinsel utensils out and do what he needs to do. Like, do what you need to do. But yet we come to church, and because you see me in the flesh, you think that that's all there is to this. And that I just woke up one day because my parents are pastors, and I just said within myself, I'll be a pastor. And it doesn't work like that. I'm not saying people don't do that, but that's not how it goes in here. That's not how it goes in here. So there's like, there's like problems. And, and if you're Lot, you would think he would be like, okay, well, like Abraham is not the problem. Because I was at the bottom and now I'm here. And the only difference between where I was and where I am is that man. But see, he didn't do that. And he said, listen, I'll go this way. And the Bible says he pitched his tent towards Sodom, which means every single day when he walked out of his tent, what did he see? Practically Vegas. Because Sodom was the worst and most wicked city at that time. And before long, he wasn't living in the suburbs. He had moved his entire family into Sodom and Gomorrah. And before long, he lost everything. He lost his wife. He lost his children. And by the grace of God, Abraham rescued him out because Abraham's love for the Lord. But he lost everything because he put his eyes in the wrong thing. So strife, envy, and jealousy get you out of position. This attitude that says there's not room for the two of us. Hmm. I thought two was better than one. I felt that way before. People that just seemed as though they were in competition. Competition with pastors Dean and Kathy. Competition with Pastor Greg and I. No, there's more than enough space for everybody's gift as we work together as a team. I'm not in competition with anybody. Nobody can do what I can do. Nobody can do what you can do. And the more of us that do it together, it's like John George was telling um, Pastor Greg and I a couple weeks ago, there's like 70-something of a certain denomination in Plainview, Texas. Plainview's small. It's smaller than Hobbs. That's a, t- what, what happens? We're in this church, and then we get mad, and so then we start another one. That's not God's, that's not how God does things. That's the things that are birthed that way. Number four, you only have to be in the wrong place one time. You only have to be in the wrong place one time. I can't tell you the number of times. It was my first time. It only takes one time. You only have to be in the wrong place one time. Second Samuel 11.1. 1. We have no other record that David wasn't with his army when he was supposed to be with his army. But it only took one time. And it came to pass after the year was expired, we looked at this earlier in the week, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab. 
and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Amnon. They besieged Rabbah, but David tarried in Jerusalem. You only have to be in the wrong place one time. You only have to miss one youth service. Many of you have heard the story, but we had an event several years ago. It was probably back in um, 2011, and it was a Christmas event at um, our house, and it was for 9th through 12th graders only. And, of course, it's a Christmas party, so you do the thing, like you have the food, and then you do, like, the white elephant thing. But the Spirit of God had given me, like, a very significant, like, message So we showed this little clip from this um, Christmas movie, and there was a token. And I, honestly, I worked tirelessly to get a couple of key people there, that it was their senior year. And I knew that we're in really, we're on really, like, vulnerable territory right now. Like, this is not, this is not looking good. And so I do everything in my power, but, like, beg like, don't miss the Christmas party. Don't miss the Christmas party. Don't miss the Christmas party. So a couple of them, and two specifically that I was really like, um, I knew, you know, they come, but they leave early, which I'm sure there were other things to do, other parties to go to that had things that my party didn't have. You know what I'm saying? But the unfortunate thing is, is the message that wasn't my message was after they left. And I think about that frequently because I know that that was one moment in time. And if those two could turn back time and Cher's voice or anyone else's, If I could turn back time. Like, she sings so low. Like, she sings like a man. Amen. They can't, though. They can't. These moments actually matter. They actually matter. And it only takes one time. If David, even though he didn't feel like it, I get it. He killed a lot of enemies. Like, literally, he killed more people than he did anything else. King David. He, I mean, so I get it. If he's like, you know what? The army's in a good place. Like, they can do it without me. It's just one service. It's just one summer internship. Blah, 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 whatever. Just took one time. And now, everything. His family, his kids. Number five. Where you are naturally is tied to your spiritual hunger. So you have to look at things from the inside out and not the outside in. Where you are naturally is tied to your spiritual hunger. We have a couple more, and then I'll get you out of here. Write this down if you've got that. Do you guys have that? Where you are naturally is tied to your spiritual hunger. Where you linger matters. Where you linger matters. Have you guys ever stayed after a movie because you thought there was more? There was going to be something after the credits. Has anybody ever stayed after in the movies because someone else was? Because a lot of times I don't look that up. Like I don't go into the movie thinking about are there extra credits. I think about like my popcorn, my snacks, my homies. Like I'm thinking about the actual content. But then at the end, sometimes when I notice like no one else is moving, I kind of linger. Now, sometimes it's a false alarm. They're old. They want to wait till everybody else is out. They may still be making out. Sometimes it's a false alarm. And so I'll just low key get out my phone and just double check and then say, hey, there's something else. Right. Why do I linger? Because I have an expectation that there's a little bit more. There's a little bit more. Like you just hang after. Like if you've ever had like people over to your home, like I've seen this, like everyone's gotten their food. And then sometimes like just gradually the guys will kind of like work their way back into the kitchen. Why are they lingering like that? They just want to know like, is there, is there a little bit more? Is there a little bit more of that? Do you have some more? 
right? Because there's an expectation that there's a little bit more. And in many cases, the more distinguishes you. Sometimes, depending upon the movie and the brand, like that leads you into the next movie. And if you didn't stick around for that, some people bounce. They didn't stick around for that. Then when the next one comes out seven years later, you know what everybody else doesn't know. You're, you're operating from, when the story picks up, you're operating from a different position because you have something different. All because you lingered. You just waited. The same thing happened with Joshua. In Exodus 33, whenever Moses went to the tabernacle, all the people, when they saw it, they stood and they would rise and stand in their tent doors. And as he entered, the pillar of cloud would come down and stand at the door while the Lord spoke with Moses. Then all the people worshiped from their tent doors, bowing low to the pillar of cloud, representing the presence of God. Inside the tent, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Afterwards, Moses would return to the camp, but, everyone say but, the young man who assisted him, I can't unpack that right now. The young man who assisted him, Joshua, stayed behind in the tabernacle. Now, who, who was Moses' spokesperson? It was Aaron. It wasn't Joshua. But when it came time for Moses to go on to glory, amen, Aaron didn't get the mantle. Even though he was very much maybe present and everybody knew who he was. It was the guy behind the scenes that, because here's the thing. This is Joshua hungry for the things of God when his leader isn't watching. This is Joshua staying in the flow behind closed doors and not just meeting his itinerary when he comes to serve. It makes a big difference. There's people who carry what I carry a little bit deeper because of how they do things behind closed doors, because of what they listen to, because of what they don't listen to, because of the conversations we have that nobody else sees. Where you linger matters. Number six, anointings aren't everywhere. Feelings are, crowds are, impartations are. An anointing only comes to its full maturity with impartation and character. So if you follow an impartation, but you don't stick with someone who will help you develop your character, you'll lose what you're given. You'll lose what you're, you're given by impartation when you don't stick with someone who develop your character. Because you'll never flow in the anointing beyond your character, beyond your integrity. It'll burn you up. So 2 Kings 2, just before God took Elijah to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were out walking. And Elijah said to Elisha, just stay here. God sent me on an errand to Bethel. But Elijah said, not on your life. I'm not letting you out of my sight. So they both went to Bethel. The guild of prophets at Bethel met Elijah and said, did you know that God is going to take away your master from you today? He said, yes, I know, but keep quiet. Now, what's so interesting to me is that all of these guys are basically in the school of ministry, but Elisha's sticking with them in a different way. And instead of calling Elijah their master, he didn't say our master. He said your master. That was a decision they made. He said, yeah, I know, but keep it quiet. Then Elijah said to Elijah, stay here. I'm going to go to Jericho. Elisha said, no, not on your life. The bottom line is, as we 
pick up in like verse 11. So it happened, they were walking along and talking and suddenly a chariot and horses of fire came between them and Elijah went up in a whirlwind and Elisha saw it all and he shouted, my father, my father, you and the chariot and the cavalry of Israel, when he could no longer see anything, he grabbed Elijah's robe and he ripped it into pieces and then he picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him. He returned to the shore of the Jordan and stood there. He took Elijah's cloak and all that was left of Elijah, he hit the river with it saying, now where is God? Where is he? And basically everyone else witnessed and gave, gave voice to the fact that now the mantle that Elijah had, Elisha now had. Why? Because he wasn't willing to let go. He wasn't willing to let go. Number seven, this is the last one. If Jesus has one spot, so do we. Jesus is God. Three in one. So if you get things twisted in your prayers and you say God died and the Holy Spirit died, just get it right. There are three in one. Jesus has one spot. Everyone say one spot. Now, I just took it from in times made easy um, just for the sake of time. And I quote, when Jesus arrives, so this is after we rapture out, after seven years of tribulation, and we all come back for the millennial reign of Christ because we will come back. You guys are too young, many of you, for the Terminator. I'll be back. Can't do it that low. I can only do it low when I sing. When Jesus arrives, blazing in beauty and surrounded by his angels, he will take his place on his throne. You will hear these words, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world in Matthew 25, 34. Israel will be the head of all nations. Jesus will rule where? From his throne in Jerusalem. That's why Israel is the most fought over piece of land in all of the world. And why people fight over Jerusalem. Because the enemy knows that's his throne. And he wants it. He couldn't take his throne in heaven. Jesus went all the way to hell and dethroned him there. And because of a complacent church, he thinks he's going to one day have access to it here. But he will not. Because when he comes riding back in glory, I'll be there. But he's going to, like, we can't even wrap our head around that. Because we're like Loki, and I'm proud to be an American. Like, I don't want to live in the Middle East. So are we spreading out everywhere? Can I see your throne from here? Because I like America. And I've never been over there. But it seems hot and dusty and dry. And I don't speak Hebrew. He's going to rule from his throne in Jerusalem and implement his kingdom there. So if there's an actual place of geography on earth that is where Jesus ultimately will do business, why do you think it doesn't matter where you live, where you go, who you're under, how you're under? That's not biblical. That you can just make it up. That you can follow a feeling. That you, can, you don't follow a man, you follow the leading. When John George asked me to be an intern, there was nothing awesome about that invitation. Nothing awesome about that invitation. It was going to cost me $3,000 for three months. I don't, we don't charge interns here. Because I, I will not be their problem. So we pay, we pay them. I mean, they get it for free, basically. I paid $3,000 for three months and I wouldn't shake, I wouldn't change it for anything. But he didn't, he didn't give me like, he didn't say, you have something in you. We're going to let you preach. We're going to let you sing. He didn't say any of that. He said, Hey, I think, I think you would be good to be a part of the internship. And I was like, that is the last thing. I literally graduated from high school on a Monday. Thank you so much, Jesus. I graduated from high school on Monday, and I moved on Thursday. And I never looked back. I had never even been into one of his meetings. Now you want to know how many followers they have, what they're doing, who else is doing it. They may not be hype, but you're hype. You're a hype beast. You wouldn't recognize Jesus if he stood in front of you like that. Because you're not spiritual. 
You don't pick up on the, cue, on the cues that go beyond what you can see. There's only one spot for you. X marks that spot. And the only way that you receive. Remember this, this wide receiver and this quarterback? Everybody else on the team, they knew. They finished each other's sentences. They're like that. They're like that. Why is that? They wanted results. They wanted to win. If you want to win, you have to defend the natural place that he has for you in every single season. Bye.